Hey, thanks for checking out the Blake Bins podcast. This episode is a special one because we got episode number 75. I cannot believe it. I knew I needed to find an incredible guest for this episode, and so I asked the beautiful, the lovely, the incredible Joyana Bins to the show today. She cleared her schedule so she could come on and talk about her business, Culture Connection, LLC. It's a business that is designed from the ground up to be something that helps people engage and connect with other cultures. I'm really proud of the work that she's doing. It's an incredible business. You can check out more at cultureconnectionjoy.com. In the meantime, if you have been enjoying the podcast, I want to ask you to help sponsor and donate and support the podcast. If you go to patron.podbean.com slash goodadvice, that's patron, P-A-T-R-O-N dot podbean, P-O-B, B E uh, P O D B E A N dot com slash good advice, and you can check out for the price of a cup of coffee how you can be supporting the podcast. Enjoy the episode, and I will catch you later. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Blake Benz podcast. I am sitting down. This is our 75th episode. And in front of me, I have the most wonderful, the most beautiful, the kindest, sweetest, most incredible guest to ever come on this podcast. And it's my mom. No, I'm just kidding. It is my beautiful wife, Miss Joyana Benz, who goes by Joy. Joy, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Joy, I know you have an actress inside of you. And so that thank you for having me was a little quiet. So I, I can tell you're, <laughs> you're beaming, but I can tell you're also <laughs> like, I want to be too over the top. But uh, I will say for the listeners that Joy asked me, hey, what are some questions that you're going to ask me so I can prepare? And being a bad husband, I told her, just like I tell all of my guests, uh, it's important that we're authentic. And so I haven't given her any questions, but I am going to ask her some hard hitting questions like, what am I going to get for my birthday and for Christmas? It's a, it's a surprise. Can't, can't reveal that information. <laughs> well, I figured for the 75th episode, which is kind of incredible, uh, you've been with me since day one of the business mm-hmm. and also with... Uh, recording the podcast. So it's kind of crazy that this is episode number 75. And it felt like a big milestone. And I was asking you, hey, I wonder who I should get for my 75th episode. And you said, how about me? (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I love that idea. Because I, I often brag about you being like, the ultimate person in my business, you know, you're the person who keeps me going and who says like all the most encouraging, incredible things to me. Well, that's kind. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, and you run a business, a much more successful one than mine. I don't know about that. Well, if we looked at the revenue numbers, we would say <laughs> yes. Because uh, pretty much what I tell people who uh, who I'm friends with, we talk about like the state of my business. Mm-hmm. I say things like, well, I have an investor who pretty much funds my business. And that's funny. you and I both know that that's you. That's and that. Me. I pretty much have drained your bank account multiple times over, and you've always been so graceful and kind uh, to me doing that, and I will absolutely pay you back one day. One day. (laughs) Yeah. I I love doing it. Yeah. Well, so uh, I I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk totally about you, just like I do with all my guests who come on the show. Uh, As you know, the show is totally geared to business owners, to entrepreneurs, to people who are they're running their own business, or maybe they are trying to start their own business. And you yourself have this incredible business. What's Thank it called? You. It's called Culture Connection. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> what what's what's Culture Connection? Okay. So Culture Connection is a business I began um, with an attempt to bridge a gap with my students to help them get connected to the different cultures around them that they're interested in. And the way I do that right now is by teaching languages. So I teach Spanish and sign language. So tell me, tell me a little bit more about like this disconnect. 
So sure. cause just especially for the listeners who maybe they don't know you at all. Mm-hmm. They're like, who's this lady? I don't know who she is, but she sounds super cute and amazing. <laughs> <laughs> who, you know, what's the disconnect? Let's get some real tangibility to this. Yeah. You know, what, what year is it, first of all, as you're thinking of this business idea? It was, it was 2015. Okay. Um, and I, I had a different job, uh, and at, on the side, I was tutoring some students, um, in the evening. I was tutoring Spanish and it occurred to me that I could perhaps grow my, my clientele or what you would call it. Um, I could increase my students if I had more time in the day. And so mm-hmm. somebody was really encouraging and supportive of that idea. <laughs> Blake. And so I quit my job. And then, yeah, 2015, you know, a year later, I I was almost working, you know, Monday through Friday, all day, whether it was lesson planning or teaching. And so in 2015, it began, it began because I saw a need, I saw a lot of people who wanted to learn Spanish, a lot of people who were interested in American Sign Language. And because I am a person who loves international people and loves learning about different cultures. I think language is a very key ingredient to opening up the door Hmm. to understanding a culture or understanding a a person of a different nationality. And those are the two languages I speak besides English. So I thought, okay, well, since it's opened up a lot of doors for me, I can perhaps do this with someone else. And it's just, it's a blast. And Hmm. so I've been doing that since 2015 and Basically, to answer your question about the connecting, yeah, I think language connects that person to that culture that they're interested in. Mm. And so I teach them language, but more than that, I also teach them about the culture, whether it's deaf culture or whether it's the Latino culture. Mm-hmm. So so you mentioned you speak a couple of languages, mm-hmm. and I know you're learning. You you know, you know have a working knowledge of a couple other languages. Sure. And yeah. <laughs> I know you would say you're not fluent. Right. But you basically are. Well, are you... Fluent in in Spanish. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, well, I was just going to ask, like, so because this is this, it's a bit interesting, and I, I want to unpack. Mm-hmm. I do want to unpack the story of like you quitting the job, sure, and like all that stuff. Because you know, there's there's tons of people right now who are thinking of their side hustle. They're thinking of like, oh, if I could only do blank, whatever that mm-hmm. is, then I would be happy, right? And right. that's it's besides the point of like the whole you know, only you can be happy type of deal right? Uh, other than like your circumstances. But besides that whole thing, you mentioned how you feel like languages is like, it's like the connector. It's like the thing that allows you to engage with another culture. Yes. It, and you said you speak a couple of languages. Did you, did you experience that for yourself? Like, is Absolutely. this? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. So, so. I, and I feel like you're smiling at me because you're like, I know you know the answer to these <laughs> things, but, but, but tell me, tell me about that a little bit. Um, so for me, it began the first, the first language I learned was Spanish before American Sign Language. And so when I was in junior high, I went on on a couple missions trips with my church. And, uh, I, you know, you had to learn your basic, you know, how are you? Hi, what's your name in Spanish? So I memorized these little phrases. Um, but what really intrigued me was when I started to use them with, um, local people in the, in the city in Mexico we were visiting when they would talk back to me very speedily, very fast. And I had no idea what they were talking about. It was just fascinating that like, this is these words that I spoke meant something to them. And now they feel a connection with me. I don't really understand what they're saying back to me. And so I, and I want to. And so, um, that started my journey of really discovering and learning this language. And so the next, every year that I'd go back, I felt more and more connected to these people because the language enabled me to get to know them mm. or and them to get to know me on a direct basis instead of using an interpreter. Mm. Um, and this, it helps you learn more about the culture. Um, it's just a very personal way to get connected with, mm-hmm. with a people group. Hmm. And then I went and studied abroad and worked in South America in Colombia for a semester. And that just really changed my life because um, before that, I thought I could speak Spanish. But then going there really showed me I had a lot to learn conversationally. And that experience is what really, really changed the trajectory of what I wanted to do. Because when I came back, I had this new heart for people who traveled to a foreign country and felt 
insecure about the native language. Because when I went to Colombia, I was just like, oh, I feel like a child who can't speak. Um, but the people who surrounded me and helped me learn Spanish really impacted me. And so I've come back and I've since then wanted to do that for other people. What, what was the impact? Because like, cause like you're talking about this story of like, I went and met these people and then I felt like this sort of, and you didn't use these words, but sort of like this burning desire to, mm-hmm. you, like you had this taste of a connection mm-hmm. with basically strangers. I mean, people you don't, you're not around every day in, in the sense of you don't live in Latin America, you don't live in Mexico, wherever. Mm-hmm. And, but so you felt this, this sort of taste of a connection to the point where you were like, okay, I, I want more of this mm-hmm. and I need to learn more of the language to do this. Yes. Like what? Like unpack that for me a little bit. Cause some people like, they're like, I don't want to make friends with anybody. I just, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, yes. I mean, I am your typical extrovert. <laughs> it is fun for me to, um, w- with any foreign language, I can be somewhere, somewhere and hear someone speak in an accent. And I immediately want to know where they're from. I want to know. Uh, so you mean like even the accent within the same language? No, like outside of Spanish. Sure, sure. In Spanish, I can maybe go, oh, you're probably from Argentina because you pronounce your double L's like a je, or you're from Colombia because you say je, or you're from Mexico because you say yo, you know, anyway, if you speak <laughs> Spanish, you know what I'm talking about. But, um, so that's fun. But I remember specifically a couple of times, like one time I was in an airport and at the baggage claim, the, the gentleman standing next to me was talking to his wife and they had a really unique accent and it just, I couldn't help myself but introduce myself and be like hi so where are you guys from you Mm -hmm. know and just I thought that was neat and then when they told me where they were from I forget now but whenever I hear what country someone's from it's exciting for me to go back in my mind and like pull out what I know of that language and if it's just welcome to America or well my name is Joy what's your name or how are you it just lights up their 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 eyes open and they're like oh wow you like know a phrase from Mm -hmm my language. And then, yeah, it happened to me in a computer lab when I was like a sophomore in college. I had a student sitting next to me who his whole screen was all just, you know, Chinese characters. And I just looked at his computer screen and I was like, can he really read that? And so I (laughs) actually made that dumb question to him. I said, can you read all of that? And he just like looked at me and was like, well, yes, I'm Chinese. And it just, then we've actually (laughs) became friends throughout our whole college career. So for me, language helps me just connect with a person. And so it's beyond just Spanish. Um, So how that impacted me in Colombia was when I came back, I immediately got involved at the university, I went at the school I went to um, in this thing called International Club. And at first I didn't think I was able to join because I was American. And then they were like, no, you're international. (laughs) You've come from a nation. (laughs) Um, but I will say, I remember, just to interrupt for a second, mm-hmm. here locally, we went, and Joy and I like to joke about this, we went to this international event, and we were just meeting people, and it was like, where are you from? Where are you from? It's like, oh, wow. And I remember I met a group of people, and they go, where are you from? And I go, I'm from here. And they go, oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, That's I'm sorry true. that I'm not eclectic enough. More exotic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and so that international club of, of students really um, propelled was kind of the incubator for when you, when I met all these people from different countries and I had just got come back from Colombia it was exciting for me to one meet other Latinos where I could practice my Spanish or or meet people who it was their first time in the states and their English was you know very basic and just be able to befriend them and be like, Hey, I know what you're going through. And so those, I could remember the faces and the people that did that for me in Colombia. And so it impacted me just with the desire to help international students and the desire to help people like me in English speakers who were wanting more of the foreign language they were interested Mm. in. So take me back to how old were you, by the way, when you went to Bogota? Um, I was 18. Okay. So uh-huh. <laughs> you're 18 years old. Uh-huh. Actually, I don't know how how much earlier before you went that this dream started. But so you have this. That's a I- whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> but so you have this idea, I, I want to go to Bogota. Mm-hmm. And at the time you were what, I was what age? At, I was 17 when that whole okay. idea was birthed originally. So you're 17 
and you have this idea. I want to go to Bogota, mm-hmm. and you tell your parents, and they presumably said, okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it was um, – it was prayed through. I was nervous about it, but my parents, uh, the family who invited me to come and live with them as a host family, um, were really real down to earth, awesome people who just cared about people. They actually worked with the deaf in Colombia. So there's all these unique, um, connections. connections. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I was studying sign language. I was studying Spanish and it was really cool. My parents, at first, I thought they would totally be like, yeah, right. There's like drug cartels there. Like, that's like, <laughs> you're not going. Yeah. But they just had, uh, they told me like, you know, if you feel a piece about it and um, that's something that you're supposed to do, then like, we'll eventually get that piece also. And I was like mm. dumbfounded at that response. Yeah. And, and what then, a, just an, I mean, that what an incredible thing for a parent to say, mm-hmm. right? To give you that trust in the sense of like, you know, it's not like my Oh, my 17 year old daughter or 17 year old kid in general. Like, what do they know? Right. But for them to say, oh, okay, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll try to get a piece about it. And, you know, yeah, it was, it was an amazing journey and a lot of things fell into place and to where it ended up making sense and feeling right. And, um, eventually my mom came with me the first week that I was there to make sure I was settled in and mm. that it wasn't all a scam and I wasn't you know, <laughs> being sold. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the movie taken yeah. and you know, um, she's like praying the whole time, like mm-hmm. <laughs> please be okay. Mm-hmm. And well, so, and I was going to ask you actually like, take me back to that very first day. Mm-hmm. Cause you were talking about like what people did for you, but maybe that's not the right question. Maybe the right question is take me to the first day after your mom left. Hmm. And it was just you. And you're obviously with the host family, but yes, yes. tell me what you were feeling. <laughs> what was it like? What was going through your head? Was it, oh God, oh God? I mean, what what was that? Um, yeah, there's definitely probably a mixture of excitement and nerves altogether. Um, I was still also acclimating to, I was still acclimating to the food and the temperature and just everything that was different. Um, I got a stomach bug for like a week when my mom had left and I was like, well, this stinks. I want my mom. (laughs) Um, I went and did a tour of the university and I just remember thinking like, okay, like I'm really doing this. The international student tour was consisted of me and two Brazilians. Um, but it was just, I remember, I also remember going to, um, this, church that my mom and I had gone to where there was just tons of youth my age where I felt like I could really get connected with some people who would like give me some type of social life outside my university. And I remember going and on my way there, I had taken the bus, I'd got off the bus, I'd crossed the street. The one contact person I knew who was going to meet me there just completely was MIA, like on the cell phone. So I was like, they're probably not even here. Like, I don't even know what to do. And I remember I was going to go back home. I had just decided I'm turning around. I'm going home. I'm sitting in my room all night. And then somebody saw me that recognized me from when my mom and I were there being introduced to them the week before. And I just remember being like, oh, hi. They're like, come on, come on. I was like, okay. I'm so nervous and I'm an extroverted, I'm, you know, person, but I think in that moment I was just really hit in the face with the idea. Like I'm in a foreign country. I don't really know anybody. What am I doing here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but day by day it got, it got easier and I felt I fit in more and more. And was there a day you can remember when you were like, I love this. Like I could maybe even like, I could even live here. Like this is, oh. or did you ever get to that point? I mean, I, I did. I I don't. I do remember. I don't have a specific memory knowing like I love this, but of just a collage of memories comes to my mind where I'm just with these people who are constantly encouraging me in Spanish, and um, where I can remember a, a question that was asked me many times, like, "Well, why did you come here? Well, what's your story?" for the first two or three times I was asked that it was very difficult for me to like get the correct Spanish words altogether that that were, um, would be my answer. And so I remember I would go home and I would write out the answer in English of like how I would want, how joy would respond to that with my personality in English. Then I translated all of that into Spanish. Then I memorized that whole thing so that I could just, you know, totally 
word vomit it like, like it was in the back of my mind, like, okay, I got this. Well, I remember when it was like the fifth or sixth time I was asked that and it just came so easily. That's when I was like, this is fun. Mm. I can do this. I, I really like this. It wasn't as much of a chore anymore. And so I can remember having a couple conversations where I felt like it came easier. And that's when I was like, this is really fun. I could, I could be here for a long time and mm-hmm. enjoy myself. Mm-hmm. And that's, I guess that's when you started feeling like you were really building these authentic, meaningful relationships with people, right? Right. Mm-hmm. I was with these people that were very kind and very fun and um, very personable. And before I reached that level in the, sp- in my conversational um, ability with Spanish. I remember being with them and in a circle, like in someone's apartment, we're just chit chatting and playing some games, eating. And I was so annoyed. I was just like, I don't get, I don't know what anyone's saying. I'm so frustrated. It looks like they're having these really deep conversations. And here I am just totally lost. And, and then it went from me totally feeling a part of that and engaging and talking. And yeah, not, it wasn't perfect. I wasn't fluent by any means during that time, but it was it, the transition from feeling totally misunderstood or like a child to then understood. And I could also engage and I could even make jokes or I could even, you know, sh- shine on who Joy's personality is, you know, like little comments here and there. That's when I was like, this is really fun. Mm. It's fun to live. I'm like almost living this parallel universe over here in this other country, the other language. Meanwhile, my like real home is back in Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, so you get home and, and maybe we could just like even jump ahead to when you started your business. Mm-hmm. You know, you talked about you, you really got involved in those years between then and, and starting your business. And I know you're still involved today mm-hmm. in the international community here at the U of A. You mentioned how you wanted to really do for people what was done for you. Yes. And I know you do that already just in your, in your spare time in volunteering there. And I know you volunteer on Monday nights, uh, teaching English, Mm -hmm. but especially as you were like envisioning the dream of culture connection, because you didn't, because here's what's interesting is you didn't just like, you were like, yeah, I learned Spanish and I'm going to teach Spanish and charge money for it. I'm just going to be a tutor or something. Right. Which is nothing wrong with, you know, calling yourself a tutor. Right. Mm -hmm. But from day one, you called it culture connection. It right. didn't morph into that. Like there was something about connecting cultures that was really special and important to you. Help me, help me draw the connection there. Like how did you, how did the dream come about mm-hmm. and, and why culture connection? Right. So to unpack that a little bit, originally I thought, you know, I have this, I have a couple skills. I can, I can communicate in sign language and in Spanish so I could use those skills that for me are really fun to to make money. So that is originally how I thought it, the money side of it is going to be teaching languages. However, the reason I didn't call it anything about just language or Spanish or sign language, and, and to answer your question about why it's culture connection, is because my vision for it is not just language tutoring lessons or, you know, l- come learn Spanish, come learn sign language. My vision for it is really to connect people and language is one of those ways. And so my hope is that it can grow into something more where I can encourage people to get involved in their local, um, maybe there's a university in their city and there's um, new students coming every semester and they can somehow get involved and befriend these people who come here and are just scared spitless. Like, what am I doing here? And excited. And they want to meet Americans and they want to practice English or they, maybe there's somebody who speaks another language and there are student teacher conferences that are really needing volunteers to help translate or interpret uh, their meetings with the their Hispanic parents. So the, anyway, I like to expose all the needs in a city or in a community where, hey, there's all these opportunities for you to get com- connected to people of a different culture, because I find there's so much value in that. If someone can't study abroad or can't travel abroad or can't go on a missions trip where you learn so much, you can do it here. I mean, the, in the US, there's so many it's, there's a lot of globalization. So in the U S you're going to find lots of pockets of different people from different cultures. And so 
besides equipping Americans or Canadians, I have some Canadian students with a language where they can connect. I want to equip, I want to equip other people who maybe they don't have a desire to learn a language, but they can learn from intercultural relationships. Mm. They can grow, they can see something different and different doesn't have to mean wrong. It can just mean different. Mm. What, what keeps someone from doing that on their own volition? Honestly, I feel like if you don't have any experience or any moment where you interacted with someone from another culture or another speaks a different language than you, then you just kind of don't know. I mean, yeah, there's people in movies and whatnot, but if it doesn't ring home to you personally, if you never had that experience, then you're not really going to think about, well, I wonder if there's any um, you know, immigrants I can go help who just moved to my city and see if they need a ride to the grocery store, you know, or if they need, do they know how to make an appointment at the doctor's office? You know, it's not going to cross your mind. I feel like it's just unaware. They're just unaware. Mm-hmm. It feels like too, that you, and I, I, I remember the time, I, I guess it was like, um, maybe two or three years ago where the EU was bringing in quite a few refugees. And I just remember you yeah. almost in tears saying, I'm, I'm flying there. I don't care how much it costs, but I want to be at the train tracks when they get there and I yes. want to welcome them. And you wouldn't even be a citizen there. <laughs> you know, you would be, you know, a, an outside yeah. of yourself, but I want to welcome them and help them feel a part mm-hmm. and, and welcomed and at home, mm-hmm. which I, I can see that heart showing up even in the story you're telling now. It feels like you really love people. Sure. Yes, <laughs> I do. It's which is kind of a dumb question. It's not like you're going to say like, well, no, I don't actually <laughs> they really bother me. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I do. And it comes from a, a combination of n- having a glimpse of maybe not what a refugee feels like by any means, but someone who's new to a culture or um, you know, Blake and I traveled to South Korea in 2017 and um, Blake stayed for a week. And then once he left, I stayed for a little bit longer. And I just remember the feeling of, you know, maybe if I'm in Europe, I can be like, oh, well, she's not, I don't stick out like a sore thumb because I'm white and I've got green eyes and light hair. But being in South Korea, it was pretty obvious that I wasn't one of them. (laughs) And I was at a grocery store and I was checking out with, I don't even, I couldn't even understand what half the things were in the grocery store. So with what I felt was safe, I'm, they're checking me out. And I just remember there's this line building behind me. She gives me in, in Korean, she tells me the price. I don't know what that means. I have coins in my hand and I just, for some reason there wasn't a screen for me to see the amount. And so I just give her some of my, the bills and I just hold my hands with like the coins in it. Like, and I just immediately am taken back to when I was a cashier at, in high school at a grocery store and there was a lot of um, Latinos in that area where I worked and they'd come through and I could, I knew they didn't speak English and they just kind of looked a little like, they looked at me with this look of like, almost like they felt inferior of some sort. And I never wanted to make them feel that way. So I wanted them to feel comfortable. So if I'd say, how are you paper plastic? And they just like, look at me and smile and nod. I'm like, they don't know what I'm saying, but I'm not going to make them feel dumb. And I just want to, you know, so I immediately felt that way when this woman was like looking at me and she was like picking the coins out, like looking at me, like, are you kidding me? You know, like, <laughs> who are you? Like, you're not get out of here. Yeah. And I was so embarrassed. I was like, Ugh. And it just, it, those types of moments fill you with that compassion to when you're back, when I'm back here now and I hear refugees or I hear of there's this amazing um, nonprofit in my our city called Ozark Literacy Council, and they help for free anybody come and learn English, but not just literacy for reading and writing and speaking, but they help them become literate in like how to function as a member of society here in the United States, what's culturally normal. To me, those things excite me because it's like those are the people who are here that are experiencing a culture shock and we don't know how long they'll be here, but I want to, I want to be a part of their journey to help them feel welcome, to help them feel a part. It's amazing. I love it. And it it just makes me so proud to be married to you. I'm just, I just, everything you just said, I was just like, wow, what a just fully noble, compassionate, empathetic. I just, I loved everything you just said. 
we should get married. (laughs) (laughs) But, but so that whole element is incredible and it makes me really proud to be with you. Separate from that, I'd like to also talk about just the journey of being a business owner, Mm -hmm. if that's okay, which maybe is a little bit less romantic, I guess, than like talking about like experiencing other cultures. Mm -hmm. But I do want to go back to literally you starting the business. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about like what you were doing professionally and like what was the moment that you were like, okay, I am, I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm starting this business. Because what's really kind of funny about you is I just talked to so many people who they have so many, they have so many stories about, or they have such like a build up to the action and you didn't have a business background. Right. You didn't, you didn't like take some mastermind on business or like go to a guru or anything. You just were like, I'm going to start the business and you just started it. Yeah. Right. And it's grown into this really amazing, incredible thing. So I want to kind of put some details around that for the listeners, especially the people who are like feverish to, I just want to start my business. Like, how do I do that? Yeah. So let's start with the, where you're working and like building up to the moment where you were like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. Well, so before Culture Connection, I, um, before I had graduated college, I got a part-time job at a, a a pediatric clinic and I was just your, your receptionist. I would schedule appointments. I would answer phone calls. And then when I graduated with a degree in communications, I didn't quite know exactly what I wanted to do, but I know what I was good at and I know what I loved. But what ended up happening was this position I was in part-time, the, a full-time position opened up. So I just thought, eh, like, I'll take this full-time position just temporarily to see kind of where it leads me. Well, one thing led to another and I just was very unhappy. It was, I was very stressed. I would come home every day with like, literal like weight on my shoulders i was like crunched over and i was not a nice person to be around Uh, blake can attest to that i didn't say that (laughs) i just was yeah it was just i was unhappy what what was it about the job that you weren't happy with well there was a lot of what hmm there was happy elements to it i had a great co-worker i had great co-workers and i had um, an opportunity to use uh, sign language in Spanish with, um, s- s- I was about to say students and then clients, with uh, patients that would come in. But the data entry, the the system changes, some of the management, basically the management. <laughs> I just feel bad. I'm like, what if they listen to this podcast? No. Um, Probably good if they did. Yeah, but. it was it was just very draining. And there was a lot of um, expectations cool. that were like weekly given to us that weren't there at the beginning. So at the end of my time there, I was like doing insurance things before when I was like, why am I doing this when I was supposed to just like schedule appointments? And Mm. then, um, there was just, there was just constant to do lists. And, um, did it, did it feel, I'm just trying to create some context here. Was it like transactional? Like, did you, did you feel like you had kind of lost like the people element? I mean, what, what was it? Because, I mean, everyone has to-do lists, right? Right. I but said like, that and I was like, well, I'm not lazy. It's no, just, no, no. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I don't know, you're not – I'm not hearing you say like, well, there was work and I didn't like <laughs> it. Um, you know, millennials unite. <laughs> but but I'm just I'm just trying to figure out like what was the thing that wasn't there that you were like, this, this isn't for me. Okay. So what stuck out that I knew it was not for me was when – What stuck out, well, when it, when I knew it was not for me was when every day, instead of the interactions between the patients and, and what I was as being like, you're a human being. Let me help you. Let me check you into your appointment. This interpersonal exchange, which is what I like, it became very high stress environment. Uh, we had to get them in and out and we had all these checklists of things to ask them. And go through each time and, and it would kind of slow down this process of like getting them checked in and getting them to the waiting room. And instead there was, um, there was just a lot of frustration. There was a lot of stress. There was a lot of, I was the middleman most of the time calling the nurses, asking the doctors if, or the nurses, if they'd be able to talk to the, the upset patient parent. And it became when I'm the middleman and I'm never, and I got someone on the phone really upset at me for asking them a question that, you know, Bob was asking me, 
And then I have to give Bob this kind, polite answer back when really the person on the end of the phone was like super rude. It just was like conflicting to my like, my heart. I was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore because I would constantly be covering for like some coworkers or some nurses, like just terrible attitudes. And I was like, I can't do this. And there's this huge stack every day of referrals, you know, to specialists or whatnot to like fax and call and make sure their Medicaid's in. And I'm like, this is not me. I'm not behind the desk, like making all these calls, having a boss behind me telling me like, make sure you do this. Let me know if you have any questions. And I'm like, okay, I have a bajillion questions, but where are you? You know? And so like, (laughs) I just was like, I'm done. And so I, I would, I would tutor on the side and I don't know if you have another question for me, but that's well, what it ended I, up. I remember you, but I remember you had one day and we didn't prep this. So, <laughs> but I remember you had one day that you came home and you were really proud and really just elated with your day. And you were like, this was a good day. And I remember it was a story about a customer or a patient, excuse uh-huh. me. And I don't know if you know the story that I'm talking about. Uh, mm-hmm. When she was, she was deaf. Yeah. Yeah. That's story. Yes. Yeah. I don't know why I wouldn't just say, you know, that story. I was actually just seeing if if that actually was I rem- still No, meaningful. I vividly remember that. Yeah, there was a, a patient, a child who came in whose mom was deaf. And she came to the window and started writing that she was deaf. And I, I was like, oh, wow. And so I signed to her, like, I can sign a little bit. And then we carried on talking about the needs of her child um, in sign language and you know, her child had all these specific needs and they wanted to get these tests done. And so I went and got my boss and then my boss's boss and they were all there and they're like talking to me and I'm signing to her and she's signing back. And, you know, sometimes I'm missing it and she's writing a little bit. It was just so rewarding and fulfilling. And the coworker who sits right next to me and does exactly what I do, she's just like watching the whole time like, wow. And I'm like, <laughs> this is so fun. What was fun about it? It was just fun being like, I'm putting to use this this skill that I have and I'm helping this woman so that she doesn't have to write down everything she wants to say. Instead, I'm just getting to I'm getting what was what's really cool about sign language is like I am communicating but it's completely silent. So after my boss and the boss's boss left, it was just her and I were just kind of chit-chatting for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then she leaves. It had been like 45 minutes and my coworker's like So what was that about? And then in my head, I've got all this information, all this, just the past 10 minutes of just chit-chatting with her, but it was all in science. So to everyone else, it looks like, I mean, she's not saying anything. That's fun to me. It's like a silent way to communicate. And what a great illustration of what it means to give dignity to someone who maybe traditionally doesn't always get it in the Mm -hmm. sense of doesn't always have the access to communication that they deserve you know, they have, they have to go about it a different way. And it kind of sounds like you help this person feel like a human again, to have like a real conversation. Yeah, man, if I could just have a whole episode about the deaf community and the deaf culture, there's so much that hearing people do not understand. And to just show them that, that you're willing to go that extra mile and use their language, it definitely, they love it. It says a lot. Wow. So you, you, you hit your breaking point or and I, and I, I legitimately don't remember if there was a breaking point. I do remember you coming home and being upset and it being this, you saying, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. Yes. And mm-hmm. so did you know then I'm going to do this full time or was it? No. In fact, what led me to my, my out there was there is a place in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I live called the Spring International Language Center. And they were hosting a program where you could get certified to teach English as a second language. And at that point, I didn't quite know exactly what route I wanted to take. I thought maybe I could teach internationals English or Americans Spanish or sign language, what have you. But I remember looking at that program and it was three months. It was intense. And then thinking maybe after I'll find this job and it'll be great and it'll be different than this. So I actually applied or registered for that program. And then I told my boss, like, hey, I'm going to be doing this program, so I'm going to have to give my two weeks or my, you know, month notice or something, kind of having an out and not, I didn't feel like being like, I hate my life here, so I'm done. (laughs) Like, you're horrible. Uh, And so I instead was like, hey, I have this opportunity. And they were like, oh, that sounds just like you. Like, oh, you know, make your dreams come true. And I was like, good. I'm leaving here on good terms. 
Then, then what I realized was this program was going to enable me. It was more for people who wanted to teach English abroad. And I thought that would be really awesome, but I'm married and where I am in my life right now, that's not really doable. So I contacted them and found out that they could perhaps help me find a job here, but I wouldn't really be certified as a teacher. So I'd kind of be in the same place where I'm like, I have these expertise and these skills, but where can I really get a a solid job? So remember at that time I was still um, tutoring a woman in Spanish. Well, then I remember it being a Friday. The, the, The ESL certification program started on Monday on Wednesday, Thursday, up to that Friday, I had talked with you a little bit about the idea of maybe creating a, an online profile where I get was able to see, would more students sign up for my language lessons? Would this, could this really work? Friday, made the profile, boom, got seven students. I was like, okay, mm, bye program. So I emailed the people. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go, like back out. So yeah, it, that began. I had then I had what, what, eight what, students. What was it about like your? Because I've, I've even forgotten this. Mm-hmm. What was it about your profile? Because I just think of so many people who they start their business and like no one, no one right. calls. There's no customers. It's like uh, right, and it's different when you're offering a product versus offering a service. But um, but I, I think on I on my profile I had a few people who I had known. I had a few people put give me reviews. So that I didn't look like I had done nothing. I had the, a couple people who I'd taught before leave some reviews for me. And I just wrote out my experience of having been a learner myself. I said, hey, I know I'm not a native, but what I can offer you is that I'm going to walk you through the exact steps that helped me succeed. Mm-hmm. What's really cool about that story is, and it's like really great from like a, this sounds so impersonal, but like a selling strategy of like mm-hmm. letting the person know you really understand where they're coming from and like knowing their pain points. Yes. And it sounds like with you talking about, Hey, I've been a learner. You, you didn't know you were doing it at the time, but you were really making this person be like, okay, this person knows exactly what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. Well, so you had the seven students and you were like, I'm going to do this full time. Mm -hmm. And you had an amazing husband who supported you through that. I did. And so you, 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 why? And I didn't, I mean, I think you were still financially supporting us like through the history of our marriage, but Uh I was like, you go girl, you got it. But so you, you started to scale this thing out to like every day now having tons of students. Right. And I don't know if you remember like how you chose like your price or any of that stuff, but maybe you can help me connect like that moment to like where you are today with your business. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I started out meeting my students locally. So a lot of them found me because of where I lived. And so I'd meet them at libraries. And, um, how I scaled that eventually was I started teaching online lessons. And so I actually don't teach any more lessons in person. I have one student who I will occasionally meet with that is lives here, but that enabled me to, um, I don't have the travel time. I don't have to like print out papers at the local library and just like, you know, use my car. I can just have a student every hour on the hour and boom, 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 and just like tackle it. And it's, it's that how, that's how it has scaled, um, as far as like my student base. And it's so fun. It's so fun. I have students from all over, like all over the U S and in Canada. And it's like, I wouldn't have got to meet these people if I hadn't. I've learned a lot about time zones also. Um, <laughs> but as, sure. but as far as what I charge, I remember being really insecure about that at first. So a couple things are what I use to gauge what I charge. And one is what is the rest of the the people who do what I do? What are they charging? What's the norm? And then two, what am I putting into, what time am I investing and inserting into the lesson preparation, um, the follow-up with the student? And so I have a website for my students to um, find resources and I have built this website And so they can go after our lesson to their, you know, we just did lesson five. They can click on lesson five and they can find different homework resources and things. And so I think of the labor of time I spend in that. And anyway, and I kind of put that all together. And so at the beginning, I didn't, I undervalued myself for sure. 
Um, I saw what other people were teaching and I thought, well, I'm probably not as good as them. So I'm going to charge. I think I began charging 35 an hour, 30 or 35 an hour. And at that point I was driving, I was meeting them there. I would then drive to a different library to meet my other student. I'd be printing out paper for the like worksheets. And so I had all these extra expenses, like tiny, but like they build up and then taxes and everything. I was like, I'm not making any money. (laughs) Uh, This is, what am I doing? You know? And, um, and also at the very beginning, the lesson preparation took way more time. Now I've got a beautiful system that I have. If you ever have a question about it, hit me up. I can let you know. (laughs) Um, but now, um, I think after two years, two and a half years of doing that, I increased my rate by, um, I think to 40. So then, and then a year, a couple, a year or so later, I increased it. Now I charge 50 an hour and I would have never dreamt of charging $50 an hour in 2015. Why not? Well, like, as you've taught me, there's this, you know, imposter syndrome. I'm like, I'm not, I don't know. I can't, no one would pay for that. I wouldn't pay for that. Like no one has that money. You know what? Well, no, I've come to find out (laughs) if people have a goal and sometimes it's their bucket list or sometimes it's because Mm -hmm. they have a family member or there's a need there and it's something they're trying, they're finally willing to put forth the time and effort and the money to do it. They will do it. And the one-on-one lesson is a very is a very great way for them to really, um, I can personalize the lessons to their speed and their pace and their needs and their vocab. Like I can definitely focus on what they need. So it's worth it. But I didn't believe that at first because I just thought, I don't really know what I'm doing is, is what I have. I didn't know if what I had to offer was really going to be successful. I felt like I was maybe fake or maybe they would finish an, a lesson with me and be like, did I learn anything? But man, I just soon learned, I mean, with all the reviews that I have and I don't like talking about it, like being like, I have all these reviews, but I mean, it just, it took me a while to finally accept that like, I do have something to offer. Hmm. Was, so, it, was there a moment that you were like, okay, yeah, I, I am offering something valuable or has it just progressed over time? It's progressed over time. I've had different opportunity, every different times when I've logged on to a lesson. And the first thing the student says is something they share a, a thing that happened this past week where they ran into a deaf person and they were able to sign with them, or they went on vacation to Mexico and they were able to like use Spanish, like every day with their, the people they came in contact with or the person at the market. And it just, they share these little moments. They're like, I remember it. I got it. I get it. And those are the moments when I'm like, okay, this mm-hmm. is fun. I'm helping you mm-hmm. make these connections. I'm helping you really to understand this language. Mm-hmm. So, and I know you said you don't like bragging on these details. Do you know about how many students you have at any given time? Uh, um, I have about, to be honest, I'm kind of bad with numbers. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd have to like, I could tell you that. Yeah. Uh, I don't like numbers. And so yeah. I'd have to, whenever anyone's like, did you get a count for that? I'm like, let me go look at the chart. Cause I have no idea. Uh, I always say, cause I have counted in the past. I always say I have between, um, you know, I have about, I have about 20, 25. At any given time. Uh-huh. And then, and then how many, how many reviews do you have? Uh, like 106, 150, um, See there again. You're cheating. You're looking it up as I'm asking. (laughs) Dang it. I don't have it on my phone. Well, Uh, how many, how many, let's just say you have 120. Let's just split it in the middle. Mm -hmm. How many of those are five stars? Um, all of them. (laughs) (laughs) I think I have one four star. It was like, she was great. And I was like, then what's with the lack of, (laughs) of the other star? (laughs) She was amazing. She changed my life. Four stars. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's why I, 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 the only reason I ask that question is I think it's amazing that, you know, 120 reviews, pretty much all five stars. uh, I just think it's amazing what you're doing. You know, you're offering something that's really meaningful to people. And it's not just, it's not transactional because you hear these stories of someone, you know, that, that connection that is so valuable to you. Mm -hmm. You get to hear about it happening for someone else. And that's kind of the magic of it. It's like, I did that for that person. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. well, cool. Well, uh, how can our listeners follow you? How can they learn more about you? What, what's the best way for people to do that? 
Well, um, I have an Instagram and it is culture connection joy. That's my handle. Actually, I think it's culture connection period joy. Um, and then my website is cultureconnectionjoy.com. And you can look more about um, like what I offer and you can read some testimonials or you can see like I have a little video compilation like that's on my website and you could even sign up for lessons on the website. And then my Instagram is kind of a beautiful like, well, I call it beautiful, but I don't know if you'll think it's beautiful, but basically it just shows some different um, ways that you can get involved in your community. It shows different things that I've done, like whether it's with international students or traveling or whether it's um, information about my Spanish lessons or sign language lessons or deaf culture or Latino culture. And um, yeah, there's just a good mixture Mm -hmm. of that on there. Mm -hmm. And then the last question for the listeners who are like on the fence of either taking language lessons or just even just engaging with another culture. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice? Just do it. (laughs) Um, Really? It's worth it. It's so worth it. And you can do it. I think what, keeps people from learning a language is the fear that they can't do it. And um, really you have the time and you have the brain capacity. There's not one person that's just born um, better at languages. I think everyone is capable of it and it's actually really fun. It doesn't have to be like your high school Spanish class. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's great. Well, Joy, thanks so much for joining us today. I can easily say that I love you. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yeah. Well, uh, for the listeners, thanks so much for listening. Absolutely. Check out more information from Joy at cultureconnection.joy on Instagram and also her website, cultureconnectionjoy.com. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Let me know what you think about the episode. If you like listening to the podcast, if you like the content that we're making on here and the people we're interviewing and the awesome stuff that we're doing, I have to absolutely ask you to consider for the cup of coffee price of only five bucks, you can support the podcast and keep it going with some high quality content and we can continue to get beautiful, amazing people like Joyana on the show. Thanks again for listening. Check the description of the podcast for how you can sponsor or support the podcast and also for more information on Joy and I will catch you later. See ya.